Hey y'all, my name is Danielle Sprague and I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Jefferson County. Um, and today we are here with um, Dr. Mark Abney with the, uh, at the UGA Tifton Research Center. All right, well, I'm Mark Abney, peanut entomologist at the University of Georgia. We're standing in the last of my test plots in, of 2020. It's October. Um, we're trying to get peanuts out of the field, and I'm talking to you. By the time you see this, we're going to be thinking about insect management in 2021, okay? This field, this might have happened to you. This field was one, we set it up. It's not irrigated. It doesn't look great. You can see the row middle still. It didn't lap up. This was going to be a lesser corn stalk bore test plot didn't work out. We didn't get lesser corn stalk borers here in this location, but what we did get was a really heavy infestation of velvet bean caterpillar. I would say overall in 2020, uh, we had what I would call a normal insect year in peanut in Georgia. Nothing was really terrible, but we had a lot of stuff. So we started out the season with thrips, which we normally do, and we had a lot of tomato spotted wilt virus, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> we had reasonable numbers of lesser corn stalk borer early. We had a lot of fields get treated in some parts of the state. And then late season, we had a, a mixture of foliage feeding caterpillars with quite a few velvet bean caterpillars. I would say maybe more than average. We had a lot of fields where growers weren't scouting and they let those caterpillars get away from them and nearly defoliate the peanuts. This was set up to be a lesser corn stalk borer trial. Actually during the it was in August, I believe, one of my employees got COVID-19. My entire lab was quarantined for 14 days and I was having to do it all by myself. And I came to check this field and found out that there was a lot of velvet beans out here and something had to be done right then. So what we did was turn this into a little bit of a caterpillar trial, if you will, and I sprayed every other 10 rows. I had a 10 row boom. We treated 10 rows, left 10 rows untreated, and we'll get you a close up where you can see the difference in where we sprayed the caterpillars and where we did not. Get a lot of questions about things like rates, we get questions about thresholds, we get questions about the residual activity of foliage, foliar applied insecticide products for velvet bean caterpillar. The reality is, is when you have velvet bean caterpillars, they almost never come back. If you spray them, they're usually gone. We, used, we happened to use Intrepid Edge in this field because it's what I had. It's got pretty good long residual activity. It smoked the caterpillars. They didn't come back. When we kill velvet beans, that's usually what we expect. I don't expect them to come back. I don't really care what the residual activity is for most products when we spray velvet beans because they're not coming back normally. So what did y'all see with thrips this year or this past year? And then what do you predict um, for the 2021? That's a great question and it's a loaded question at the same time. So thrips pressure in 2020 was, I would say it was normal. I didn't get a lot of calls from growers saying the thrips are eating me up. My thrips uh, insecticide that I put out at plants not working. I didn't get a lot of that even though we had plenty of thrips pressure in the field. But what we did see was a lot of tomato spotted wilt virus. And as we all know, tomato spotted wilt virus is spread by thrips. Okay, so the thrips were there and they were spread plenty of virus and they spread the virus. So the question becomes, why did that happen? We didn't see tremendous numbers of thrips like we did maybe in 2014. So why do we have so much virus? And in Georgia, it came down to several factors. One is we had seed quality issues, which led to skippy stands. So skippy stands, is, it's, a, it's a major risk factor for thrips and tomato spotted wilt. If a good stand, twin row peanuts, uh, reduces your risk. Single row peanuts, and then you add skippy stands on top of that you end up with more thrips and more tomato spotted wilt virus. And we saw that a lot in 2020. But that's probably only part of the story. Another part of the story is, is when we planted peanuts in 2020, our conditions weren't altogether favorable. I mean, we were putting peanuts in the ground, it got cool on us, and then the peanuts aren't growing as well. That also led to some stand issues, and so we had problems with peanuts coming up out of the ground. People ask me questions like, well, is, are the, is the resistance in the varieties we're growing now, is it, is it starting to fade? And I don't think that's true. Uh, we've never had complete resistance to tomato spotted wilt virus in any of the varieties we grow. We call it field resistance. Um, we still have it, the varieties still do very well, but we do see virus in these peanuts when we have a lot of virus in the system. Uh, I think that this year we're probably going to see some yield loss that growers aren't accustomed to. Part of that's because they had lower stands to begin with, and part of it's gonna be contributed to by the fact that there's more virus than we're used to seeing. 
what are you going to do about it? I mean, that's really the question. So growers looking to 2021, it's great to talk about 2020 with 2020 vision or whatever, but 2021 is coming around and what are we going to do? Make sure you buy high quality seed. <clears throat> and most folks are going to try to do that anyway, right? They're buying seed from a reputable dealer and they hope they get high quality seed. And then you may be sitting there watching this video and said, I, I paid a lot of money for my seed in 2020 by God. And I expected them to be good and they weren't that good. Um, but that's the first thing you do is you buy high quality seed. Then you got to think about your planting date. Here in Georgia, we recommend people to plant peanuts after May 10th. And the reason we recommend that is because the risk of spotted wilt goes down after May 10th. We can grow really good peanuts planted in April. In fact, our highest yielding peanuts will be planted in April. So you got to plant some peanuts in April in Georgia but if you're going to grow a lot of peanuts because you got to start planting. But don't plant your entire crop before May 10th. Spread it out and hedge your, your risk really over that time window. So you got to think about planting date. The other thing you're thinking about is what are you going to put in furrow with the seed? Okay, we've got some options. People are wanting to put imidacloprid, that'd be Admire Pro or one of the generic products. You want to put that in furrow to protect from thrips injury. And it will do that. It'll protect the peanuts from thrips injury. But it does not reduce the risk of tomato spotted wilt virus. Okay, people say, well, I'm, I'm killing the thrips. How does it not reduce the risk of spotted wilt? Well, it doesn't, right? The thrips have to feed on that plant to get the insecticide in order to die. And that feeding that they do is enough to transmit the virus. So if we're going to do something for spotted wilt with the insecticide, we have to use Thymet. It's the only insecticide we have that reduces the risk of tomato spotted wilt. And you say, well, it's what it, you just told me that imidacloprid in furrow kills thrips, but it doesn't tr prevent the transmission of the virus. What does Thymet do differently? Well, if you use Thymet, you're familiar with Thymet burn, right? Everybody, some growers hate Thymet burn. You can ask a room of growers, how many of you hate thymet burn? And a third of them will raise their hand. I can't stand it. It's terrible. I personally don't mind it. It does two things for me. It tells me that the thymet's there. If I go in a field and the grower says, I put thymet under these peanuts and I don't see any thymet burn, I said, who, who put the thymet out? And if he didn't do it, I'm asking, like, what? Well, somebody probably messed up, okay? But the thing it does is that phytotoxicity is it's causing a change in the plant, a physiological change in the plant, an upregulation of a bunch of genes and it makes that plant less susceptible to tomato spotted wilt virus. So the, the key things, get good seed so you got a good stand, and that's for everything. You gotta start strong. We gotta think about our planting time. Think about the planting window. If you're in Georgia, you wanna make sure you're planting some of your peanuts after May the 10th. I don't, you may have a different recommendation in Florida for planting date for tomato spotted wilt virus. I don't know what it is. And then third, if you had a problem with spotted wilt in 2020 and you did not use Thymet, you need to consider using Thymet in 2021 if you think you lost yield, because those are really the three things you can do to reduce your risk of, of spotted wilt without changing things like row pattern, which most people aren't going to do from one year to the next. You're not going to plant single row peanuts this year and go out and buy a twin row planter next year. Some might do it, but most aren't going to, right? We can reduce our risk by planting strip till into a lot of residue, but if you're not set up to do that, you're probably not going to all of a sudden do that for 2021. But the three things we talked about are what what most growers can do easily enough to reduce their risk of virus in 2021. So we talked about, you talked about um, using infra applications. When would someone um, do a foliar application for controlling thrips? So that's a good question and it comes up a lot. There's a couple of scenarios, right? We've got some growers who put insecticide in the furrow and then you have some growers who don't, right? And growers, we'll start there. Growers who don't put an insecticide in the furrow very often need to apply a foliar insecticide because thrips are going to cause some injury there, right? So the question is when do you do that? Most of the time our growers aren't going to be scouting for thrips. They want a calendar date. I planted my peanuts, when do I spray them? For me, I want to look at a peanut at about the time it comes out of the ground. If it comes out of the ground and there are thrips on it and there's nothing in the furrow insecticide wise i'm going to know I'm, I'm going to need to spray those peanuts within a week i want them all out of the ground but i'm probably going to have to spray them if i'm 14 days after planting and i don't have any insecticide in the furrow and i'm concerned about thrips injury i'm probably going to spray them around 14 days you can find some stuff online you can see hear people talk about 21 days in my experience 21 days is too late if you spray it 21 days most of the injury most of the stunning's already been done and you'll kill thrips 
and your peanuts are going to grow out of it, but they would have grown out of it anyway. You want to prevent that injury from happening, and that's why I say 14 days. I want to look at them at 14 days. If I go in the field at 14 days and I'm not seeing any thrips, I'm not going to automatically spray. But I would say most peanut fields in Florida and Georgia are going to have thrips, and if there's no insecticide in furrow, then they probably would benefit from a foliar spray. Now the question of a grower who puts imidacloprid in the furrow, for example, or 4-8 thymet in the furrow, when do they need to come back with a foliar spray? Most of the time they don't, right? If things go according to plan, if everything goes the way we want it to go, you won't need to come back with a foliar spray. So there really isn't a, a specific time frame for that. In my opinion, imidacloprid provides just good enough control of thrips to be worth using. So there's a lot of growers that like it because it's easy, right? I've got a liquid tank on my tractor. I don't have to fool with granulars. I'm putting a liquid in the furrow. The injury that I get, I have a zero to 10 rating scale. 10 is a dead plant. Zero is perfectly fine plant. When I get to a five, if I brought growers to the field and the, the rating was a five, most of them would be like, eh, I don't like that. Imidacloprid will bump up against a five every year and then it'll usually go down. But if you hadn't had that product in the furrow, you'd probably be at an eight or a nine. So normally, I don't think an additional foliar spray is needed. At least it's not in Georgia. Thrips biology is driven by environment. You get 100 miles south of here, things may be different. But here, I certainly don't recommend an automatic foliar spray. Uh, if it was me, I'd, be, I'd look at my peanuts at 14 days after planting and make a decision then. If I'm seeing a lot of thrips at 14 days after plant, then I might consider a foliar spray even if I had an insecticide in furrow. Maybe, maybe it didn't rain and my, the plant didn't take the product up. Maybe it rained too much and imidacloprid leached out. You got some factors like that to consider. Maybe there was a mistake at planting time and the product you thought got applied didn't get applied. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you see in terms of insect pests in, um, a, compared to like a conventional system or, or a, a no-till or um, strip tillage system? Yeah, that's, that's also a good question. And, and when you're talking about a crop where the fruit is underground, tillage can make a huge difference, right? I mean, it makes a difference with a lot of different insects, but for soil insects, it can really matter. So it's, it's a really important question when you're talking about things like potatoes and, and peanuts and things like that. So, I mean, if you start from the very beginning, probably the most dramatic impact of residue on the ground is with thrips. Thrips don't like a lot of residue. So if we planted peanuts in, in deep turned, clean, bare soil, and right next to it, if this row was, had wheat or rye residue, this row would have a lot of thrips on it and very likely this row would not. It's that dramatic. The reflectance of light off of that residue, they don't like it, it repels them. Sometimes it looks better than a, tre a treated row that's on bare dirt will have more thrips sometimes than an untreated row with a lot of residue. But there has to be residue. Just no-tilling into bare dirt doesn't help you. Just no-till into, say, cotton residue may not help very much. But if you've got a small grain residue out there and there's a lot of it, then that can really make a huge difference. When it comes to other insects, it's pretty variable. For most of the insects that we see, it's not, the tillage practice is probably not all that important. One exception to that is burrower bug. Um, that is a pest of, in Georgia that it's sporadic but for people who have it, it can be devastating. Um, it seems to prefer, at least it, it, the damage is more common in reduced tillage systems. Uh, we don't really know what the impact of the cover crop is on that or the residue is, uh, but we certainly see more injury year in and year out where we don't till, it, till as aggressively. Um, we've had trials, I've had my own trials, some of the most dramatic on-farm trials I've ever done was tillage for burrower bug. And it was sort of like I told you with, with thrips. We deep turned these peanuts and these peanuts were planted, reduced tillage. There were no burrower bugs here and these peanuts had over 50% burrow bug injury. And it, these bugs can move, so they could have gone there if they had wanted to, but they didn't. And that lasted season long. So I, I can't explain why that happened, I just know that it happens. And for people who have burrower bugs, and if they tell me, well, I've got burrower bugs, it's a problem for me, but I'm not breaking out my bottom plow, I will tell that person that if they can continue to grow peanuts the way they were, then go ahead. But I can't help you much if you're not willing to, to till the ground. There's not much else we can do. So very good question. I have this specific problem. 
and we go through and you t maybe you talk with the specialist and you talk with the other agents and you say, look, hey, he's got this problem. I don't want to supply our mites, but we have to solve this problem today, right? We got to deal with the problem we got today. Spray the pyrethroid if that's what you got to do, and then we'll deal with the mites. But most of the time, that is not going to be the answer. Most of the time, there's an alternative that's probably better, even if we weren't worried about mites. So absolutely, we want to keep the pyrethroids out of non-irrigated peanuts unless it's absolutely necessary. But it can be a great tool for velvet bean caterpillar in irrigated peanuts. It can be a good tool for if you got to kill potato leaf hoppers in irrigated peanuts. It's a good tool for them. So are there thresholds that you would use for the velvet bean caterpillar? And yeah, and when? so absolutely. The, and that's one of the good things about caterpillars is there's some pest and you call me and they say, well, I've got I got potato leaf hoppers. What's the threshold? There really isn't one, right? You kind of got to go with your gut. How many are there and how much injury do you see? Caterpillars, we've got thresholds. Um, the threshold is four to eight caterpillars per row foot. And you say, well, God bless you got thresholds, but one of them's double the other one. So what does that mean? Well, peanuts that look like this, the threshold is close to four. These are not good peanuts. They're intentionally not good peanuts. We didn't water these peanuts. We planted them really late. We were trying to get lesser corn stalk borer here. The reason we go to the low end of the threshold is because I can't afford to lose a lot of foliage here, right? I don't have a lot of foliage. They never lapped the middles. They didn't lap the middles in the bed. They didn't lap the tractor middles. So I can't afford to lose a lot of leaves. So I'm going to lay down at the number at the four per foot. Like this is a foot, okay? All right, four per foot, not this. This is not a foot, one foot. Right? If we had peanuts that were this high, and we do, right? I could have, two weeks ago before we harvested them, I could have taken you peanuts, they would have been knee high. If we had four caterpillars per foot there, it would have been no problem. Most growers would still choose to spray that because they just don't want to see the caterpillars there. But if they didn't, it wouldn't cause them a problem in terms of yield. So four to eight per row foot, it, I would say if growers would wait to four, if you just wait to four, you'll save yourself money. Most folks won't wait to four. They'll go out and they'll see that one spot with a lot of caterpillars. I got four per foot here, but the rest of the field is one per foot. They'll go ahead and spray it. And they may say, well, I'm making a fungicide spray anyway, and it fits. I don't have to come back to the field. That makes sense. All right. But if you're going to make a special trip to the field, it doesn't make sense. All right. You don't want to spray below threshold. It does not make you any money. It does not save you any money if you're spraying below threshold. So I want to go back to the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. So can you talk about talk about that and when we should be um, worried in the season, when we should worry about um, yeah, those, and yeah. then talk about control? Sure. Well, first thing I say is I'm never worried about three-cornered alfalfa hopper. <laughs> um, we see them a lot, and growers see them. They're, they're, they're big enough to see flying through the field. And when you walk through the field or drive through the field, they're going to fly. The adults are going to fly up, and you're going to see them. And they can be present in really high numbers. So it's not a surprise that when growers come in, what's it doing? It's eating your peanuts. I mean, it's eating the plant. That's what it's doing. And if I've got a really high population of an insect eating my peanuts, I'd be concerned about it too. And they can cause yield loss. So I will say that. We have done a lot of work with three-cornered alfalfa hopper, and it can reduce yield. But that effect is variable. It, the, the environment plays a huge role in that. There's not really a threshold for them. And so what I, this is what I tell people. If you have three-cornered alfalfa hoppers and you have irrigated peanuts and you're going to make a fungicide spray anyway, I'm going through that field, I'm going to spray it anyway, go ahead and put a pyrethroid in and kill the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. If your peanuts aren't irrigated and it's even the least bit dry, or if your peanuts aren't irrigated and you know that there's some spider mites in cotton nearby, or spider mites and vegetables nearby, just let it ride. Don't risk flaring mites to kill three-cornered alfalfa hopper. It's not worth it. The only, if, if pyrethroids weren't so cheap, I would say you probably shouldn't spray them even in irrigated peanuts because the, the damage that they cause, the yield that you're going to lose is not much. You won't notice it probably. But at a $3 an acre spray, can they do $3 worth, eat $3 worth of peanuts? Yeah. But I would way rather lose $3 worth of peanuts than flare spider mites. And we don't really have any other alternatives for controlling three-cornered alfalfa hopper that's cost effective other than pyrethroid. So if we've got them and we want to spray them, pyrethroid's where we're at. And I mean, we'll start to see them. We can see them in May. We certainly start seeing them in June. Usually in July, the numbers get big. Sometimes August and September, they're through the roof. 
by September, it usually doesn't matter anymore. We say if you're within 20 days or of harvest, you don't even just ignore them completely at that point, no matter what. But um, it's one of those things that's in the field. Everybody knows about it. Everybody wants to know what the threshold is. There really isn't one. They can cause damage. They are technically a pest, but I don't get too concerned about them. Um, so let's transition and talk about um, below ground pests like mm -hmm. the lesser cornstalk burr. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. There's, I don't know, there's three important, really important below ground pests in Georgia and maybe four. The most important is lesser cornstalk borer. Um, it can feed above ground or below ground. It's a caterpillar. Um, the, it, the adult is a moth. Um, it causes the most serious injury in peanut when it occurs and it occurs in hot dry years and we had some hot dry periods regardless of what you may hear about how much rainfall there was in 2020 there was some hot dry weather and we had lesser cornstalk borer in Georgia and we had to treat quite a few fields for them uh, I guess we'll go ahead and I'll talk about the treatment now so if you've got lesser cornstalk borer if it five years ago ten years ago the only option was granular lores band granular chlorpyrifos uh, that product has been under regulatory scrutiny for the last few years. It's still legal to use as of October the 22nd, 2020. I don't know what the future holds for it. I, I expect we probably need to have an alternative for it for every use. Uh, right now, we at least have alternatives for lesser cornstalk borer and peanut, and that's a good thing. Uh, Chlorantranilaprole, which is the active ingredient in Prevathon, it's also one of the active ingredients in Besiege. Does a really good job as a foliar application for lesser cornstalk borer. And people ask me, how could it possibly work? That it's called a borer for a reason. It bores into the plant. It's protected from a lot of insecticide applications. How does it work? I don't know exactly how it works, but we've done it enough to know that it does. You can say, well, I, I used it one time. It didn't work that good. Anything that can happen will happen, right? Nothing works 100%, 100% of the time. So. Yes, it's possible that you didn't get good control, but I would say field in and field out, we get really good control with, with Prevathon and, and, and Besiege. We gotta be careful with Besiege because it has a pyrethroid in it. So in non-irrigated fields, which are at highest risk for lesser cornstalk borer because they're not irrigated and they tend to be dry, we just gotta be careful about flaring mites if we choose that product. The other product that we use as a foliar spray for lesser cornstalk borer is Diamond. It's a growth regulator. And it's also given us really good results. And people say, well, which one should I use? I really don't care. In my trials, when we apply those two products side by side, the end result is the lesser cornstalk borers die. Uh, they do die quicker with the Prevathon, the active ingredient in Prevathon. Uh, the growth regulator takes longer. Uh, both of those products have long residual activity, uh, several weeks. Uh, so it's not really, that's not a concern. I mean, look at price. Look at what, how, how many do you have? Did you miss them? Are they feeding? If I, if I pull up this plant and I've got lesser corn stalk more. So that was going to be another question I was going <clears> to <throat> ask. How would someone scout for them? All right, we'll talk about that below. in a second. Right, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. But if I pulled this plant up and there's lesser corn stalk bores hanging out of these pods, I want them dead today, right? So in that case, I might choose to use the, the Prevathon or Besiege because I, I'm going to get quicker activity. But if that's the case, you missed them. You had an opportunity to, treat, to pick which product you wanted to use earlier. Uh, but it doesn't matter, you can't go back. But that, that would be probably the only scenario where I would have a, just a really strong preference is I, would, I need these things dead as fast as possible because I don't want to lose any more yield. When it comes to scouting for them, I actually have a video on my blog that describes how to scout for lesser cornstalk borer. We'll link that but up. You can link it up, but I mean, it really, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. There's a stem that's busted open. That probably was lesser cornstalk borer. I said they didn't come here, but they, they were here. They just weren't enough of them to have a test. But you're gonna come in and you're gonna move these plants back like this. They call it, they create something called a silk tube. So there'll be silk soil hanging on the silk, hanging out of the plant. You can see that pretty easy. The moths are a huge indicator. The caterpillars are hard to find because they're usually inside the plant. But if you see a lot of lesser cornstalk borer moths, you have a problem. That trap over there is a lesser cornstalk borer pheromone trap. Um, I put it out and two days later it had like 60 moths in it. And I'm like, I'm gonna have a great trial here. And then it all kaput. They, they never, really, never really came on enough to have a trial. 
Uh, but yeah, take a look at that video. And if they, anybody has any questions, they certainly can get in touch with me. So would the threshold, I mean, I know they're below ground, would the threshold be the same as above ground or how, how would a grower determine when or That's a great how, question how to take too. action? It, it's not the same as other foliage feeding caterpillars. Because for example, if I pull this plant up and I see lesser cornstalk borer damage, um, I'm gonna try to find that, that insect, but what are the odds? I've got all these stems he could be in. I've got all these things. I'm, a, I'm an entomologist, I do this for a living. I'll probably find him. But if you're scouting your peanuts and you gotta get done in a reasonable amount of time, if you gotta scout 500 or 1,000 or 20,000 acres, you can't spend all day busting open stems. That's right. But you can see the injury. Um, the threshold is 10% of the plants with a lesser cornstalk bore in it. If I'm coming to these peanuts and I'm gonna check, I, I say I check three feet a row for foliage feeding caterpillars. I'm gonna take that three feet a row, I'm gonna bend it back. I would have done that first. I'm looking for signs of lesser cornstalk bore. If I see that and it's fresh, if I see that at three out of the 10 spots, I'm thinking about treating that field. If I see that at three out of 10 spots and I find a caterpillar or two, and I see moths, I'm gonna treat that field. It's one of the few pests that I would recommend to spray based on caterpillar, the adult, I mean, not caterpillar, based on the moths, based on the adults. Most of the time we can see moths in a field. It doesn't necessarily mean the caterpillars are there. With lesser cornstalk borer, they will, the population will get going in your field. They basically will reproduce. The moths will keep laying eggs in the field and then they'll reproduce and their, their babies will become adults and lay eggs in the field. And so, um, if a grower calls me or an agent calls me and says, man, the, the moths are out the wazoo, I, I can see some injury on the stem, I just can't find the caterpillar, spray the field. The products we have, the foliar products, have good enough residual activity, even if they have cycled out. When they come back, when the, when the eggs are laid and those caterpillars hatch, the product will be there because it has that long of residual activity and we can get them. So that's lesser corn stalk borer. I said there's, there's three or four. The other ones, peanut burrow bug, we've talked about that, okay? Um, it's really sporadic. If you look at it at an industry-wide level, you'd say it's not important, right? Some small percentage of peanuts every year are affected by peanut burrow bug. But if you're the farmer who has peanut burrow bug, it could devastate your farm, right? So it's important to the growers who have it. Uh, we've talked about it before in Florida. I talk about it in counties where it's a problem in Georgia. Uh, it's like a stink bug that lives in the ground and it sucks the juice out of the seed. It sticks its mouth right through the pod wall, sucks the juice out of the seed, and you really don't lose a lot of yield to it. What you end up with is a quality issue. They grade the peanuts and they see the spot that's left on that seed. It's just a little yellow sunken spot, and now all of a sudden you got insect damage, and it only takes three and a half percent by weight to go from seg one peanut butter peanuts to seg two frying bok choy peanuts, and we, you know that's not good. So. Um, so peanut burrow bug is another one. Uh, in Georgia, and I don't think y'all have to deal with, with this one, is, is rootworms. It is a wet soil pest. If your soil's not moist, you won't have rootworm problems. But we grow peanuts, and I know, I mean, there's some areas in Florida with some red clay, and I'd be surprised if they don't have any rootworms there, but our, our, around Plains, Georgia, those growers have to control rootworms every year. Uh, it basically the immature stage cannot live out of the ground. It's in the ground. It feeds. It'll, it'll bore a hole right into the peanut. It's difficult to control. As of October the 22nd, 2020, Lorsban Chlorpyrifos is the only thing we've got to control it. And if we don't come up with an alternative to that quick, we're probably going to be in trouble in parts of our state. Uh, so rootworms is the other one. And then the, the fourth one that's probably more of a problem than we know is wireworm. There's never been a lot of work on wireworm in peanut. It's present. Growers who have consultants, those consultants tell me they see wireworm. Uh, I've had a couple of consultants in 2020 tell me they've seen more wireworms this year than they've ever seen. And I don't know if it's just they, you know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if there's something different or if they're in some different fields or what, but wireworm is the same thing. It completely lives below ground and it bores a hole and it'll eat the seed out of the peanut. So those are the four main soil insects with lesser corn stalk borer being by far the most important and most common. Well, Dr. Abby, thank you so much for, for taking the time to share with us today. We certainly appreciate it. Well, Danielle, I appreciate y'all coming up to Florida. It's always a, a pleasure to speak with the Florida people, even if it's 
through a video camera, but hopefully by 2022, we can make the short trip down and see everybody in person. But in the meantime, I mean, y'all got a great staff down in Florida for questions that growers have, but if they want to get in touch with me, my information is available on our website. I have a blog uh, that I post peanut pest information. I tell people I don't write about where I went on vacation or what I, my wife cooked for supper last night or what my youngins did in ball. All I write about is insect pests and peanuts. And if there aren't any, I'm not going to write and fill up your inbox. Uh, I think uh, Ethan said he'll post the, the URL for that. The, and you can go, go to that. You can subscribe and you'll get an email and then you'll know what at least is going on in Georgia peanuts. And I think from my perspective, the more information you have, the better off you are. You can choose to use it or not. But a lot of times the problems we have, y'all, y'all, they start down there and work their way up. So you may already know about it. It might be old news for you, but uh, maybe you could get something out of it. We will post the videos we talked about. The scouting videos are there. Uh, you can see those. So anyway, if, if you sign up for that, you'll get updates when we update the blog. But anyway, it was great to be here. I'm glad y'all came up and hopefully it was useful and somebody could learn something. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome.